Oi! The uh, f balance sheet of the Fed was $500 billion at the turn of the century. It had taken, um, you know, roughly 84 years to get there from when the Fed opened uh, in 1914. Uh, during the first few uh, years of uh, this uh, century, the Greenspan pumped money like no tomorrow, uh, trying to bail out the economy from the dot-com and tech crash. Uh, that, of course, produced an even worse housing bubble, and then uh, the uh, consequence of that in 2008 and 2009. But the point is that on the eve of the Lehman filing, the uh, balance sheet of the Fed was about $850 billion. In the next 13 weeks, which isn't a long time in the scheme of things, the uh, Fed, led by Bernanke, increased its balance sheet by one and a half times more than had occurred during the first 94 years of the Fed's operation. 13 weeks, 150 percent of what it had taken 94 years uh, to create. Now, that's, that's just madness. That's... Uh, there was no uh, predicate for that. There was no historic tradition or learning or f even financial theory that says you should take the balance sheet from, you know, $850 billion to $2.2 trillion in 13 weeks. And what it did was uh, it uh, fundamentally uh, ruined Wall Street. All the lessons that should have been learned uh, were basically... Uh, interrupted uh, by that madness that Bernanke undertook. And once they had increased the balance sheet in this uh, uh, fantastic uh, way, they didn't know what to do next, so they just kept doing more until uh, obviously we got into Q2, Q3, and a $4.5 trillion balance sheet. Now, I think that when you have, as we have today, a society that's so, uh, a public narrative, I should say, that is so focused on the minute and the hour and trading conditions in Wall Street, both uh, the uh, overnight market and the cash market, that we lose all sense of perspective uh, when uh, you look at things uh, on a day-to-day -day or even hour-to-hour -hour basis. But the fact is, when you take the balance sheet in a few short years, from $900 billion to $4.5 trillion, it's the biggest financial fraud in human history. Trump obviously promised that he was going to make the American economy great again, and uh, he said, uh, check with me later and I'll tell you how. <laughs> I mean, there was no, uh, most campaigns have uh, pretty thin gruel uh, for policy content anyway, but his was uh, completely, uh, you know, uh, content free. He uh, said that uh, we're losing jobs massively, which is true, but he didn't say how he would uh, uh, bring them back other than that we had bad deals and that he was a deal maker par excellence and he would take the skills that uh, led to his real estate empire, whether it was true or not, uh, he would apply those to renegotiating all our trade deals, and that was going to make everything better. That was complete nonsense. None of this had to do with bad trade deals. NAFTA was what it was. Uh, you know, and NAFTA didn't cause our trade deficit with uh, Mexico to uh, rise to $70 billion today when uh, in 1991 we actually had a surplus with Mexico at the same time that our trade balance with Canada has been more or less uh, uh, close to zero for the same 25 years. Now the point is uh, this is a function of monetary policy. It's the fact that we've inflated the costs and wages in our economy to a non-competitive level in the global market where we buy and sell goods and mo money flows and finance flows uh, you know, in its trillions uh, day in and day out. So uh, he had no content uh, to policy. He just said, uh, trust me, I'll make some good deals and it'll get better. But uh, the point is in Flyover America, they were desperate enough for a change that they were willing to take a chance. Uh, I call it the Hail Mary of politics. Trump uh, said he's the king of debt and he's proving it at the federal level. Uh, you know, it's bad enough when you have a giant deficit at the bottom of a business cycle in the depths of a recession or in the year or two of recovery. I don't think it really solves anything, but at least it's understandable in terms of the fiscal math. 
But when you're 10 years into a recovery, when you're at month 115, uh, where we are today, uh, and therefore the second longest business expansion in history, you have recession uh, facing you around the corner. It's written on the forehead of the economy because sooner or later uh, the economy is, is going to roll over. Here's the key point and, and why um, you know, the, the uh, next shoot of fall is going to be uh, fairly traumatic and unpleasant. He is going to need to borrow in year 10 of a business cycle uh, 1.2 trillion, an unheard of kind of number, over 6% of GDP, at the same time that finally and belatedly the Fed is beginning uh, to normalize its policy and uh, particularly uh, shrink its balance sheet through the QT program at a 600 billion rate. Now, they make this sound very antiseptic. We're just going to roll, let it roll off. Uh, that's not true. They're, they're effectively, as an economic or financial matter, functionally selling the debt. We are at a point of peak Trump. I, I actually, in my book, identify a specific date, uh, September 20th, 2018. The S&P uh, peaked at 21, uh, 2940. That happened to be exactly 800 points higher than Election Eve when it was 2140. So uh, Trump called it one big, fat, ugly bubble, an overvalued market, an accident waiting to happen in the campaign. He was right then, and yet he's such an incorrigible egotist that he could not prevent himself from embracing 800 points of gain that were utterly unjustified and that uh, are going to come back to bite him hard as the air comes out of this balloon. Uh, the the uh, point, though, is it was only symptomatic, embracing the bubble. I call that a rookie mistake. Uh, Ronald Reagan knew better when he took office. We had a mess then, too. But he spent three years denouncing the failed uh, Jimmy Carter economy, uh, denouncing uh, the failed policies of the Dem uh, Democrats. He never took ownership until we got to 1984. Trump is making the opposite, he took the opposite position. Within days of being sworn in, all of a sudden, you know, he was talking about uh, the Trump uh, bump and an economy that uh, he was taking credit for that was actually failing. What he doesn't seem to realize is that at the end of every long business cycle, and we've only had two over 100 months, uh, you do get an unemployment rate down to 4% or 3.7%. You know, that's like the law of economic gravity happening. He had nothing to do with it. And we know from the 60s, the first cycle that lasted that long, by the time you get to 3.7% unemployment, you're about a year away from a recession. We know from the 1990s, the longest cycle, 119 months, that when it hit 3.8 uh, in uh, the spring of uh, 2000, we were less than a year away uh, from uh, the next uh, recession. So uh, Trump has uh, really made a huge mistake embracing the uh, so-called booming economy, embracing the stock market. That's why I call it uh, uh, peak uh, Trump. And uh, the problem is, having made that mistake, as uh, everything comes unwound this year and next year, which it will, he's going to get blamed for it. It's going to be the same thing that produced Trump in 2016, <laughs> will produce, I think, a left-wing populist income redistribution-oriented, redist uh, uh, let's get the billionaires uh, uh, candidate, and uh, that will mean uh, some pretty uh, s serious repercussions for policy and it'll mean the end of the dream on Wall Street.